This is the Modern Architect radio show and podcast. The Modern Architect features one-on-one interviews with renowned and cutting-edge architects, influencers, and sustainability leaders. Our show informs and illuminates the transformation that architecture brings to our cities, communities, and lives. And now, introducing the host of The Modern Architect, Tom Dioro. Today, we're uh, really honored and and I'm I'm really excited to uh, talk with Anders Lasseter. Uh, architect and principal of Anders Lasseter Architects in Laguna Beach, California. Anders focuses on innovative designs for residential, commercial, restaurant, and hotel projects, as well as being a licensed architect in California, Texas, and Hawaii, and a certified green building professional. For more information, feel free to find him on the web at AndersLasseterArchitects.com. Again, that's AndersLasseterArchitects.com. Today's episode is made possible by Swatchbox, the leading sample platform for architects and designers. Swatchbox brings thousands of product samples from the world's leading manufacturers into one platform. Browse materials for inspiration, create custom collections, then request your samples for free with automatic next day or second day shipping. Get started at Swatchbox.com. Anders. Hey. Hey, hey. <laughs> Great hey to now. have you on the show. Hey now, Thank hey you now. very much. Thank you for having me. What an honor it is to be here with you. I appreciate you thinking me worthy enough to be on the podcast. It sounds oh. like a a great uh, a great additional thing for the students and the folks at large to be able to hear and uh, have conversations, you know, so to speak, in this COVID world of uh, just getting access to these ideas. And I love talking about architecture. So when I was told that you might be interested in talking with me i said yeah get in here let's go yeah thank you for inviting me to your place as well yeah it's, yeah it's my uh, pleasure excellent. welcome excellent andrews we talked about just before the show started is you have a quote yeah. or a mantra and share with uh, your audience today more of a quote less okay. of a mantra but it's okay. something that you know goes through my mind with regularity and it's a quote that comes from igor stravinsky's uh book the poetics of music my favorite book about architecture that's not about architecture. And one of the things that Stravinsky says in this book is the idea that whatever diminishes constraint diminishes strength. The more constraints one imposes, the more one frees oneself from the chains that shackle the spirit. In other words, when you have the act of creation, that act must be governed by and influenced by a number of restrictions to help guide us and make decisions about where we go, what we choose to do, and why. And Stravinsky found that when he constrained himself even more beyond that which might have been the constraints of the, uh, the commission he was asked to do when he was writing his music, when he himself po- imposed more and more restrictions, he found himself more and more creative suddenly he found himself able to go places he wouldn't have chosen to go before, but because of the constraints, he had to work his way around. And so in the world of architecture, we are thriving, if you will, because of constraints. We have the constraint of the site. We have the constraint of the client and their needs, their budget, what we can and can't do, where the views are or where the views are not, where privacy is or isn't, where you can take access. All of these constraints conspire together to help us understand why we would choose to make an architectural response. And I think the word response is a really good way to talk about architecture because all great architecture has been in response to a given set of factors. And so those constraints Stravinsky talks about are the same things we think about when we think about making uh, building choices. What are we responding to and how can we allow those uh, constraints or factors to find their way into our creativity and challenge us to do better than we could do otherwise. Anders, for you personally, why do constraints really matter and actually sound like they actually excite you? They are exciting. In fact, I, you know, I sometimes use the analogy of like the game of chess. It's a it's highly constrained game. It has a limited field on which you play. It has a limited number of moves, a limited number of pieces, but an unlimited number of opportunities, right? When you see the system of constraints really as the field on which you play the game, how you play the game suddenly becomes the exciting part. And now you get to navigate through, in and out of, around, on top of, below, all of these different constraints. And your result, your your output, 
as a result of those constraints is just all the more exciting. That's what I've found. So I always welcome opportunities to be constrained. And when you don't have them, you really aren't able to move. I, I don't think that you can make a decision unless you've got something forcing you in one direction or the other. That's terrific. Where did you ab- adopt this attitude, attitude, way of being? Sure. Is it something that you've had recently? You, as a kid, if you can recall back as far as you can, where do you think this really kind of formed in, in, in you, Anders? Studying architecture at Cal Poly Pomona in the mid-90s, we had an instructor who was very passionate about the idea that the decisions you make about your design ought to be informed by something outside your whimsy, outside your whim. In other words, there had to be a governing idea that helped you make decisions about something. And that governing idea is going to set limitations on where you can choose to go. In other words, I can't wake up this morning and say, ooh, I've got a really got a good idea. I'm going to go this way. It might be a really good idea, but if that idea doesn't serve your concept, if it doesn't serve the main theme for your project, it doesn't belong in the project. In other words, it's a good idea that has no usefulness to you. And so having a set of constraints, creating a boundary within which you work, is actually the most freeing thing because it eliminates all of the bad opportunities that you don't want to be wasting your energy chasing down. Would you say that discipline is freedom? Discipline absolutely is freedom, yeah. In fact, there's another part to this quote from Stravinsky. He says that whatever constantly gives way to pressure constantly renders movement impossible. In other words, think of it like this. A ship that moves through the water requires its rudder for guidance, right? The rudder is the thing that steers the ship. The rudder is an absolute device of pressure. When you push against the rudder, it pushes against the water. The water pushes against the rudder. The rudder pushes against the boat. The boat changes direction. If it weren't for resistance of you against the rudder, the rudder against the water, the rudder against the boat, the boat would never move. You can't steer without pushback. So when you have pushback, you have the ability to move. And movement is freedom. Go even more in depth. (laughs) Okay. Well, let me, there's another real great, I think, uh, example of this. And it happened during the 1960s, during the Mercury, um, not the Mercury, excuse me, the uh, Gemini, the Gemini space program. If you remember, Mercury was to try to get astronauts into space. Gemini was to try to get the astronauts out of their capsule and floating around in space before Apollo then took us to the moon. So the astronauts in the Gemini program did the first spacewalk. And no one had ever been free-floating out in space before. So this astronaut leaves his capsule, and he is um, tied with an umbilical cord, of course. But as he gets out into space, he realizes that if he waves his arms, unlike being in water, he's not going anywhere. He can kick his feet, he can wave his arms, but none of it matters because in space, there is a vacuum. There is no, there is nothing to push against. There is no resistance. And within a matter of seconds, this poor astronaut found himself in a completely overwhelmed condition. His body didn't know what to do. His brain didn't know what to do. He was immobile. No matter what he did, he had no movement. He was completely without constraint. And when you have no constraint and nothing to push against, you cannot find a direction. And he really, he went into panic. The flight surgeons were convinced he was going to have a heart attack and die outside the, uh, the, yeah, outside the capsule. So, you know, he pulled himself in via his umbilical cord, climbed back into the capsule, closed the door, and I think spent 20 minutes just like trying to calm himself down because he had had one of these just terrifically panicking moments where there is no ability to control yourself. When you have no constraint, you have no control. When you have no control, you have no freedom. You're dead in the water, so to speak, or dead in space, as the case here. And how does that work with even some of the clients that you've had? You don't have to name names or projects, but sure. w- w- where initially it was just, oh, how in the world are we going to do this? And it came well, out gorgeous. I think oftentimes clients come with a misconception that we as architects disappear into a darkened room and, you know, just gestate on this idea and turn around and spit out this object, right? That we make things and we don't make things at all. The things are a product of what we make. What we make are responses. 
and we respond to a number of factors. So my first contact with clients is always about understanding what are the factors that I can respond to. Help me out. Let me understand what we got here. Where's the property? What are the constraints of the property? Physically, how big is it? How steep is it? Is it flat? Is it on a hillside? Does it have a view? Does it not have a view? Are there neighbors around it that can see it that we need to screen you from? Are there other factors like noise that we need to be thinking about? What about the constraints of the local jurisdiction? What are the setbacks, the height limitations, the lot coverage maximums? All of those things that contribute to how we would choose to make a building and place that building on the property start to add up in my mind as little breadcrumbs along the path, if you will, right? If you think about Hansel and Gretel needing to find their way home, these constraints become my breadcrumbs and they help me find my way to the home that I design for my clients. Fascinating. You're listening to the Modern Architect podcast. We're talking today with Anders Lasseter. You can find uh, more information on the, the website at AndersLassiterArchitects.com. Again, that's AndersLassiterArchitects.com. Again, Anders, if, if you talk to some of the, uh, you know, if you don't have to share names, but if you can talk about a project that you can most recently that was so constrained, yeah, but yet the final analysis, it was fantastic. Sure. Well, it's... It's an interesting story. We just recently finished construction on a house down in the Three Arch Bay community of South Laguna Beach, a community that is filled with constraints, um, which to the client, I'm sure, was nothing but a problem. Uh, the way he saw it was these people were keeping me from having what I want. And in some ways that's true, but what we looked at it as as a set of opportunities, rather, to, so that we know what we can't do. If you tell me what I can't do, I can then begin to understand what I can do. When I understand what I can do, I can see the best way to do that thing. So at this particular property, it had a number of interesting physical constraints. Number one, it sloped very steeply from the front at the street. It sloped about 25 feet up to the very back. It also had a cross slope so that the north east corner was about 15 feet higher than the southeast corner, which meant it had a slope in two directions. And because the height restrictions are measured based on a factor of the slope of the lot, that meant that I had very limited places where I could put the building without exceeding the height limits. So that meant we had to design a home that had almost like Think of a dog bone, if you will, like what a dog would chew on. It's got nubbies at one end, and then it's a long, skinny middle, and it's got some nubbies at the other end, right? The house is in many ways like this dog bone. It's got nubbies at the front and nubbies at the back and a long, thin element that connects the two together. When you have that reality of where a building can go based on what the site will allow, you're immediately thinking about what parts of the program, what pieces of the puzzle will fit into that available pattern, right? So we ended up with a home that had uh, a three-car garage at the street side and above it a beautiful deck as the roof of the garage. Next to the deck was the living spaces, the, let's call it the front part of the nubbies of the dog bone, right? And then behind it was this thinner connection, circulation spine, if you will, that connects back to the back end of the house where the other nubbies were. That was the guest bedrooms and the master bedroom that rose above it. So the location of all the pieces and parts really fell into place once we understood the limitations we had to deal with. So in some ways, I mean, I don't, this is going to sound flip, but in many ways, the house kind of designs itself once you know what your limitations are. Now, the truth is you still have to make an architecture, right? As an architect, we want to be thinking about how do we master what I truly believe are the fundamental aspects of a good architecture? What are the assets that make up great architecture? Space. Do you have enough of it? Is it in the right place? Space. Proportion. How do you regulate that space, right? A, a massive space could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Just having a lot of space doesn't make for a good anything. You have to have the right space in the right place with the right proportion. Space, proportion. Light. The third is light. It's the elusive building material many architects don't understand, and it's the one material that brings to life the space and proportion that you've worked so hard to create. And at the end of this little recipe, I have this little four-fingered recipe. My last finger is material. 
because it doesn't matter what you make your building out of if you can't get space, proportion, and light correct. It doesn't matter. It's still not going to be a good building. You could put the most expensive materials on the crummiest building and you just have a pile of expensive material. But if you master space, proportion, and light and then choose the materials wisely to support what the first three are doing, you'll have a likelihood of having created a, a good building. At least those are the things that when I look at great buildings, the buildings that move me, the buildings that seem to have outlasted the designer, the buildings that transcend their time, that go beyond their use and become something more than just what they were designed for, those buildings seem to exhibit those four traits. A mastery of space, an understanding of proportion, they're thoughtfully lit, and they understand material in a way to support those three. So we use that as a bit of a recipe, if you will, to help us guide and navigate where we're going when we're designing. Elusive material. You called light elusive light. material. It's very elusive. Sh share with that. Well, light is, unlike any other part of the building, light is temporal, right? Light doesn't mm -hmm. last. It, it starts and it ends. Uh, it's there in the morning. It's gone in the evening. And when light moves across time and space it shifts the way we perceive the building. If you've ever watched the light come in through the stained glass windows of a Gothic cathedral in Spain, you've seen the atmosphere over the course of the day shift. And one building could be perceived one way, that same building perceived another just in a matter of hours. So light is the material that really does bring life to architecture. Architecture is otherwise static, right? We are alive. We move around in the building, but the building doesn't move. It just sits there. Light is what activates the building. Light is what we're drawn to. Whether it's the absence of light, I, I often use this example when I, I teach a lot and I talk to the students about light is a material you need to use and know how not to use. In other words, darkness is as powerful a, an attractor as light is. If we are out hiking and you stumble across this little dark cave, you're going to be like, hey, what's up in there? I, I stick your head in, right? You want to see what's beyond. You want to go past that threshold of darkness to see if there isn't something else on the other side. Architecture gives us the opportunity to create that sensation by choosing when things should be dark and choosing when to reveal the light so that we can move you subconsciously through a space. If nature does it, and if it works that effectively out in the in a hiking trail, and I see that dark little cave, and I'm like, dang it, I want to go explore. Why can't I do that? In my buildings? Why can't I give my users that same sense of experience, of discovery, of exploration? Because there's nothing that excites the human psyche and the soul more than to like chart a path and discover something and stick their nose in where maybe it doesn't belong just to see what's gonna, you know, bite back, right? Uh, I think great buildings do that. I think great buildings give us opportunities for abundant light and not abundant light so that we can live in that world in between, right? It's like, why do you, why do you put salt in a chocolate chip cookie? Because the salt makes the sweet taste so much better, right? How do you have light if you don't have dark? Discovery. You mentioned that a couple of times, the yeah. importance of discovery. Absolutely. Do you think it's as important, perhaps even sometimes more important than even creativity? That's a really interesting question because I think, I believe that there is a misconception that we architects uh, create. I don't think I create. That's an awfully powerful word. I think I discover is a better word. Because when we're thinking about designing a home, the act of discovering a good solution for my project is so exciting and so fulfilling. The idea that I could just, you know, like I said, close my eyes earlier and recede to a darkened room and just sort of conceive of something and pow, out it comes. That's like the Genesis creation. But we architects don't work that way. We work with the idea of discovering, of trying things, of exploring those darkened caves until we see that it leads to the light. That's the act of designing and being, I think, a thoughtful and responsive architect one who's willing to adventure a little bit, one who's willing to go beyond the threshold that might be comfortable so that we can explore the areas that perhaps yield the kinds of solutions we're not familiar with, right? And I think that there isn't anything better than when I myself come up with an unfamiliar solution and I'm like, oh my goodness, that, that's so cool. 
Now I need to just make sure that that experience transfers over to the owner, to the user, to the people who occupy my building. How can I, as the architect now, embody that idea, that notion of discovery, that act of revealing something that I just went through? How do I make the building communicate that to the world at large? And that's really the core of what an architect does, right? We're communicators. We communicate through the built environment, and we give our users, the people who occupy our space, opportunities to find, discover, and engage with the building in a way they may never have before. That's just so intoxicating when you can do that for someone. It's something I haven't asked before in all the interviews I've ever asked is, how important do you think f being fearless is in being a good architect? Oh. It's the first question of time I've ever asked know. that question. So I, I think fear is a answer. really, I think fear is a good force. I like fear. I, there are probably some fearless designers out there whose work I don't particularly like because being fearless means, uh, not everybody listening will like this, but I think it also <laughs> means being reckless. And I don't think that we as architects can afford to be reckless. I don't think we can afford to design based on folly. I don't think we can afford to make things in the built environment that don't have a justification for being that is absolute and true. So fearless, I think, can be a real problem. There are things you should fear, and fear is a good reaction. It's a human reaction, and I think we should always trust the human reaction because our innate inner bodies, our souls, our you know, essence, that human quality, is what guides us in everything we do. And if we trust it, if we listen to it, if we into it, then we're going to make good decisions. So I like fear, actually. I think fear is a good thing. Fear is the thing that like wakes me up at three in the morning sometimes when I go, oh, what did I forget about? You know, what did I do wrong on that project? And if I was fearless, then I could barrel ahead recklessly, and I don't want to do that. This is a terrific show. It's also the Modern Architect, KZSU Stanford, 90.1 FM. We're talking today with Anders Lasseter architect and founder of Anders Lasseter Architects in Laguna Beach, California. For more information, feel free to visit their website at AndersLasseterArchitects.com. Again, AndersLasseterArchitects.com. On the, uh, the, the subject here that you had, an absolute and true, hmm. why does that matter so much to you? I think I believe. I prefer the words I believe. I say I think a lot, but I really mean I believe because this is something I believe and it may or may not be true, but I believe that when we use guiding principles that have a power and authority outside our day-to-day -day musings. In other words, I didn't just wake up this morning in a good mood, so I decided to design a happy building and I don't wake up tomorrow in a bad mood and design a morose building, right? My moods, my temper is modulated and controlled by principles that live outside of my whimsy. And by principles that live outside my whimsy, I mean things that I can rely on that are absolute and true. I happen to be a musician and I love music theory because it is a very rigid, very strict, and very specific set of interrelationships between notes and rhythms that are governed by mathematics that are absolute and true. There is no way to say that the relationship between, let's say, middle C and the E above middle C, that is a given relationship for all time, immemorial. It, it cannot be changed. That is so powerful because that gives us something we can rely on. And if you think back to my earlier quote, what we rely on can be pushed against. And when we have something to push against, we can have movement towards or away from that thing, but we can have movement. And so thinking of things that are, in my mind, my beliefs, absolute and true, gives me the ability to at least have confidence in them as a foundation from which I can catapult in one direction or another, or a foundation that I can grab onto, and I can hunker down, and I can weather the storm, right? So absolute and true is different for everybody. But it gives me, I think, a position of power and something that I can rely on and, and use as a justification. I don't have to say to my client or the people who judge my work, I chose to do this because I wanted to. I like to say, I chose to do this because there was no other choice. Oh. To arrive there, you've got to have a tremendous amount of curiosity. Where did this come hmm. from? 
yeah, that's a good question. Um, I will tell you the thing that led me to being an architect. And it was the act of creating something and watching someone's face as a result of that creation. So very specifically in seventh grade, we had a wood shop. This is back in the day when they taught, you know, shop class, wood shop, metal shop. I even remember we had cooking class. I think they taught us how to do laundry. I mean, things they don't teach kids anymore, right? So in seventh grade wood shop class, the instructor starts the class by introducing how to do basic mechanical drawing. Here's a compass, draw a circle. Here's a T-square, draw a line. Here's a triangle, now draw a right line next to the line you drew. Let's make a box, right? Just building on some fundamentals. I was fascinated by that idea. Here we could take some basic tools and start to create some fairly complex shapes. Uh, the next step was, let, now let's take that circle you drew and go over to the woodworking tool and cut out the wheel of what is going to become a little truck that can hold a potted plant that you're going to finish and give to your mother for Mother's Day. And I'm like, oh my God. You mean we can go from a blank piece of paper to drawing and conceiving of something, creating it with tools and bringing it into three dimensions, finishing the object and giving it to someone. And you can imagine the look on my mother's eyes when I revealed this beautiful wooden thing that probably gave her splinters because it was, you know, my first attempt at anything. But still, the reaction was so powerful. And it was right at that moment I knew. I said, okay, my life must be based on creating for people. I really like the feeling that I get when I can conceive of something, make something, and transform somebody's face into that powerful smile, into that powerful sense of achievement, like that's intoxicating, right? That's the best drug you can possibly have. Whether it was performing music or being an architect, that ability to just transform the world around you with your actions, it's so satisfying for me. Anders, is there anything that you'd like to share with your audience today that we didn't have discussed or talked about? Oh, I think there's a lot of things to share. You know, one message I would have is that we architects do best and we'll do our best work for our clients when they have a level of trust in us. Trust is a, maybe it's the secondary elusive building material outside light, right? Because you can't build anything unless you trust. And that's not an easy thing to do. I've certainly had trust issues myself when folks are helping me with things I don't know how to do, building a website, for instance. Good Lord, I mean, I need a level of control over everything I do, otherwise I go into a panic attack. And yet I know better that when I surrender that and give a level of trust and uh, pass on my ability to let go, and give someone else the reins of control, I will be the benefactor of what they're good at doing. And so I always encourage my clients to think about that and give us, as their architect, a level of trust. It's not easy. We're talking about a long time and a lot of money and an object that you're going to be theoretically living with for a good part of your life, right? So you really are, there's a lot at stake when we do our work. There's a lot at stake and that can make a lot of people nervous. But if you do trust, the right architect that is, not every architect, just the right architect, and you find the right architect, the one you feel you can trust, the one who speaks to you in a way that resonates, that makes sense, who you think can interpret your needs into a built form, that's the one you trust. But give them absolute trust, and I guarantee you'll find that the result comes back to you tenfold from what you'd ever expected. At least that's been the experience with my clients who've trusted us. Uh, they'll say it. I'll say it, that makes for the best possible relationship. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's definitely worth doing. Excellent. Anders, it's been a terrific time having you here. I'm Thank really you. honored, really. Thank you. That's kind of you to say. I, I, yes. I feel blessed that you came, and this was a lot of fun. I told you earlier I love talking about architecture, <laughs> so if uh, you wanted to go for another hour, I'm game. But. Excellent. Well, we're happy to have you back. Thank you. Very soon that would if, be you're, great. if you're interested. It. Love to have you back. Right on. Thank you so much, Anders. You're welcome. You've been listening to The Modern Architect. I'm Tom Dior. Our guest today has been Anders Lasseter, architect and principal of Anders Lasseter Architects in Laguna Beach, California. Anders focus on innovative residential, commercial, restaurant, and hotel projects, and he's licensed as an architect in California, Texas, and Hawaii, and is a certified green building professional. For more information, feel free to visit his website at anderslassiterarchitects.com. Again, that's anderslassiterarchitects.com 
architects.com. Join us again next time when we welcome another outstanding architect, engineer, influencer, or civic leader committed to positive and sustainable cities, communities, and lives. Thank you for listening. Today's episode is made possible by Swatchbox, the leading sample platform for architects and designers. Swatchbox brings thousands of product samples from the world's leading manufacturers into one platform. Browse materials for inspiration, create custom collections, then request your samples for free with automatic next day or second day shipping. Get started at Swatchbox.com.